Keep Up Health in Halifax. And it's really my pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm speaking about a topic that I'm very passionate about, diabetes technology, um, and the updates that are in the pipeline and what to expect in the future as well. Um, and before I begin, I just want to say thank you so much to the Lowens, uh, to Health a Diabetic Child, to Halifax Health, um, UF, Michael Lill, everybody who took time to put the conference together, and to Dr. Johnson for that incredibly inspirational talk. So, um, so let's get started. Uh, right now that endocrinologists and anybody who's treating a patient with diabetes 
diabetes and patients with diabetes should know about is something called time and range. So who here knows about time and range? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so we're looking to see how much or what percent of the day our patients are in time and range. So that's the goal between 70 and 180 when we're checking the sugar. Um, above, so to be considered to be really on target, we're looking to see that time and range is 70% or above. And obviously the more that we're in range, the higher, you know, things are kind of flat and the day seems not to have as many roller coasters, right? And that's what we're trying to accomplish. So greater than 180, we, um, you know, standards of care is that around 25, less than 25% is ideal. And greater than 250, we're really looking for less than 5% of the day to be there. So obviously less is better there. In terms of hypoglycemia, so less than 70, less than 4% of the time. And then we really don't want to see any of that severe hypoglycemia or less than 54, so less than 1%. <coughs> now again, these goals change with, preg with pregnancy, with um, well, patients who are older or more brittle, but that previous slide that I showed you kind of is the, the layout and the goals for most patients. So this is kind of just goes through. You'll see on um, these two bars, that target actually goes down to 140 for patients uh, in pregnancy, but or with gestational diabetes, uh, even if they do have pre-existing diabetes. Uh, but really we're looking over at that first section for patients with type 1 diabetes and most with type 2. So when they looked um, to see what was really differentiating patients with excellent control or hemoglobin A1C less than 7 and those with, um, who are considered to have poor control or hemoglobin A1C greater than 9, they saw that patients who use insulin pumps more often had more success. Those who did more finger sticks throughout the day or used a continuous glucose monitor were more successful. Um, those who missed fewer insulin doses. So we're going to talk about you know, technology that reminds patients to take doses um, and other things that aren't maybe a pump. That's not the right fit for the patient. Um, bolusing or taking insulin before the meal rather than at the time or after the meal. It makes a really big difference, especially because insulin, especially no log, human log, what we commonly use in, um, in pumps, does take some time to work. So if you're gonna use it before or after you eat, you're not gonna see the same results. Um, and then using specific insulin to carbohydrate ratios. So that's something that requires, you know, the diets and endocrinologists, diabetes educators, and, you know, it takes time to learn. So it's all about putting the pieces together. So what is a continuous glucose monitor? So this is, comes in many different forms, and you might have seen a lot of advertisements if you're not familiar already. But these are things like the Freestyle Libre, the Dexcom, Medtronic Make Sensors, um, there's one called the Eversense that we'll talk about. And these are devices that measure the fluid between the cells. So it's a little bit different from the measurement you get when you prick your finger. But it is pretty accurate. Um, and these devices, depending on which one they are, can be worn on the arm or the belly or in pediatric populations, sometimes on the flank as well. So they come with three components that we have to keep in mind. So there's the sensor, which monitors the real-time glucose every five minutes. And that's inserted under the skin with a simple application device for the most part. Um, there is the Eversense, which is a 90-day sensorware, and that's inserted in office uh, if you have a, a doctor who can do that for you. Um, it's usually worn between seven and 14 days, um, except for the Eversense, which is a 90-day wear. Um, it's a, and that's the sensor. So the sensor, um, also we have to make sure that there's the transmitter piece of the continuous glucose monitor. So that transmitter sits on top of the sensor and sends data either to a receiver or to the phone, depending on the device and depending on uh, which product we're talking about. Most have a reusable transmitter for three to 12 month wear and the Freestyle Libre, uh, which is a 14 day sensor, has the transmitter alongside it. So that's replaced every 14 days. Now the receiver 
Twitter, as I, as I just mentioned, um, can be a few things. So that can be its own device, uh, which comes from the company, or the t uh, phones have um, applications for, uh, for these uh, sensors, which we'll talk about in detail, or um, they can be transmitted directly to the insulin pump, depending on the system. So I always get some questions like how accurate are these readings depending on uh, or in relation to my capillary blood glucose. Like if I were to check my fingers today, how come I don't get that exact same number? Um, so we have to keep in mind a, a, a topic called a mean absolute relative difference. And that basically means the error between the capillary, or the capillary blood glucose readings that you would get if they were all kind of um, centralized or, you know, referenced versus the continuous glucose monitor readings. And if we're looking at most of the products on the market now, there's a less than 10% difference between these devices. And the lower that number is, so now we're looking at devices that only have like 8% difference on um, on average, or 9%. So that means that the sensor technology is getting better and better. Um, really, the main thing that patients notice is that when their sugar is at a good level, they'll see that the, the sensor reading that they're getting and the one that they do with the finger prick are pretty similar. They're gonna notice that those, for the most part, tend to be pretty good because we're thinking about it like a trick. So the first number there that it says SG is the sensor glucose, and the BG is the blood glucose. So when things are kind of on a stable track, you're going to see that those numbers line up pretty nicely. But when you're going through those periods of highs and lows, that's when you're going to see the biggest difference between your finger stick and what you're reading from the sensor. So when, when you're going up, you're going to notice that you're going to see that difference first with the finger stick. And later on, you'll notice that on the sensor, and vice versa when you're going uh, down. So that's why it's always good to remember, don't throw away your meter when you're on the sensor. You need to make sure that you have the meter, that you're calibrating if that's appropriate for your product, um, and that you, know, you keep these principles in mind when making treatment decisions. All right, so I'm going to talk about a few different products. So the first thing, um, and one of, there's so many you know, different companies out there that are making similar products, but they're all a little bit different. Um, so this is the uh, Guardian Connect sen sensor, um, the Guardian Sensor 3, and this is from Medtronic. So this is a standalone sensor. Um, and this product will, as we mentioned, um, has that sensor piece, the transmitter, and then the information can be transmitted to the phone. Um, the sensor life is uh, seven days. Um, it's small, discreet, um, can be worn, you know, in the shower, um, swimming, um, and it, it is an option for patients as a standalone sensor. The next sensor I'll talk about is the Dexcom, um, which a lot of patients are probably familiar with. Um, these are just the pieces of the Dexcom. So as we talked about, there's an auto applicator. So that's what uh, provides a simple sensor insertion. Um, you just take off that little orange tab, push the button, and the sensor is placed. Um, the sensor, as you can see, has that small wire, and that's inserted just under the skin. Uh, with, and that sensor has a 10-day life. Uh, the transmitter is fastened on top of the sensor, and then the receiver's uh, display devices are either the Dexcom receiver itself or a phone, and there are applications for both Android and iPhones depending on um, the type of Android phone. So you might be thinking, okay, these technologies sound great, but what is the evidence behind using them, or what are, what are we seeing when it comes to the data? <coughs> So when they looked at the Dexcom in older adults, they saw that the time um, for hypoglycemia, meaning glucose values less than 70%, decreased from a baseline of 5.1% um, to 2.7%. So that was 39 minutes less time 
where patients were in hypoglycemia, which for, you know, that is a significant amount of time if you think about it, um, that feeling of getting low, shaking, sweaty, not being able to process thoughts as well, that was, uh, was really decreased statistically. Um, and compared to baseline, so for patients who were doing just normal finger sticks, they noticed that um, before the study, 4.7% of the time patients were um, hypoglycemic, and that pretty much remained the same at the end of the study. The mean time spent in time and range, so that range that I was talking about between 70 and 180, which is what we consider to be the sweet spot, the good control, um, that was increased by 8.8 .8 percentage points higher in the continuous glucose monitor. So this is not involving other changes or anything. This is just with involve, uh, this just is down to wearing a sensor and how that really helps patients become more aware of their glucose values at any given time. Um, there are alarms, so when patients start getting low or when things are climbing up, we can make treatment decisions quickly. Um, and especially for those with hypoglycemia unawareness, um, so people who do not actually know that they're low, these devices really can be life-changing. Um, for teens and young uh, adults who participated in the study, they noticed that the time and range increased by more than 1.7 hours every day um, compared to those who monitor their glucose with just normal finger sticks. And that is also incredibly significant, and that was very statistically significant from scientists. So the future of Dexcom. So the Dexcom product is very popular, widely used, heavily advertised, um, and we are excited to know that Dexcom is continuing to innovate. Um, they will be coming out with a new sensor. It's in the pipeline, but it's kind of down the road. Things, unfortunately, have been a little bit delayed with COVID because of FDA approvals, um, but we should be expecting the, the Dexcom G7 within the next year, two years. Um, it's roughly the size of a coin. They're saying it's about the size of a nickel. So it's even smaller, much smaller than the regular one, which you see on that side of the screen. 60% smaller. Uh, the transmitter and the sensor go together. So instead of worrying about the different um, timelines for the transmitter and clipping that on, it'll be easier for insertion. Um, it has a shorter warm-up time, and what I mean by that is when people first put on the sensor, they have to wait two hours for it to work uh, or get readings on their receiver, and this is going to be a shorter warm-up time. And it's a 10-day wear time, uh, which will then, which is what the current sensor is, but they're hoping to extend that as the technology moves forward. So there's some excitement, exciting uh, changes that are happening in Dexcom, uh, hopefully in the next so the next uh, product is the Freestyle Libre 2, which is very popular. Um, it's a 14-day sensor and transmitter um, that are inserted together. Uh, and it, as same with the Dexcom, which I don't think I mentioned, there's no calibrations really needed. Uh, the Dexcom can be calibrated, but the Freestyle does not have any um, calibrations. Uh, the options for the receiver are the uh, the receiver itself, which is pictured here, or um, with the iPhone, they do have an app, so they're hoping that the Android app will be coming out soon as well. Um, the Freestyle, I think, is a really excellent choice for uh, a lot of the patients I see because of its ease of um, insertion. I think a lot of patients who are a little bit intimidated by technology find that it's incredibly easy to use, um, very user-friendly, so there's definitely benefits of all the products and this is a good one. So the next step with Abbott and Freestyle is they're thinking about the Freestyle Libre 3 in America. They already have it in Europe, so they're a little bit ahead of us over there. Um, and the Freestyle Libre 3 is smaller and thinner. We're talking the size of two pennies stack. Tiny, that is so tiny. Um, more accurate, more discreet. Um, real-time blood glucose readings. So right now with the Freestyle, you're still gonna be waving your phone or the receiver over the sensor, but this is gonna be continuous, just like the next one. Um, and real-time alerts as well. So this is a really exciting um, update for Freestyle and Abbott, and hopefully
hopefully we can get it into America soon because I think it's going to be helping a lot of patients. So the freestyle leave rate outcomes, um, mainly we're looking at the hypoglycemia side. So for type 1 patients, there was a decrease in 40% of hypoglycemia episodes, um, meaning less than 70, that lasted about 15 minutes or more. Um, when they looked at patients with type 2 diabetes, they also saw a 54% decrease in hypoglycemia. Um, it, for serious hypoglycemia, so we're thinking less than 55, uh, when they did the study for type 1 patients, it decreased that rate by 50%, and for type 2 patients by 53%. So that's pretty, pretty good when it comes to um, hypoglycemia uh, prevention, uh, especially the freestyle being rate 2 with the alarm. Um, and that, that's kind of just pictured there rhetorically as well. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind is that those types of outcomes or those things that we're seeing is sustained over time. So not only when the patient is first using it that first week, they're still seeing that same reduction in hypoglycemia at three months, at six months. So that's really important to know. And the last product item that we'll talk about in terms of sensorware is something called the Eversense. Um, this is a 90-day sensor that's inserted in office. So it's a little bit different from the other ones um, because it does require a physician. Um, it uh, has a sensor uh, that's inserted subcutaneously, lasts for 90 days. The transmitter uh, part is pictured there on the right, and then it connects to a phone app. Um, currently, this sensor is not pairing with any of the pumps that we'll be talking about, but it is an option for some patients. So this kind of breaks down in a table form, you know, the comparison between the different sensors, um, the different warm up times, the wear length, um, the design of the sensor, and then also taking calibration. Um, so meaning you have to do finger sticks in order for the sensor to continue to work for the day, um, or you're going to get the arms. So all of them um, have their merits. It's just a matter of finding the right fit for the patient, making sure that it's a it's a good um, it's a good fit. So sometimes you know we like to I, I want to use technology in clinical practice, but I do not um, discount the barriers that there are to technology. Uh, one being cost. So that's the most common barrier. So some patients will always. Come, uh, you know, come to me about how you know the real. Uh, they love it, but it's just the cost um, issue that, that prohibits them from wearing it day to day. And in that case, you know, each circumstance has its own um, situation. But really, uh, there are ways to to think about sensor wear in a smart way. Maybe we're going to use the sensor more uh, when the clinical when a change has been made, maybe you know, during a time where we're making a lot of insulin adjustments and things like that, and then we'll go back to not wearing the sensor if there is a cost issue. So there are things that I would still say um, are worth thinking about in using technology. Um, age, I honestly don't think that this is a huge barrier. So I have seen patients who are, you know, in their 70s, 80s. I have a patient who lives in a nursing facility, but she's so uh, invested in what her numbers are, and she doesn't want to wait for someone from the assisted living facility to check her glucose for her. She's been type 1 forever, and so she feels like she wants that autonomy. And for her, wearing a sensor has made a huge difference. So she feels like she has that power back. And that mindset of having power over her diabetes has helped her become so successful. So I feel like age, honestly, is, is just a number. Yes, it can be prohibited for some patients, but for those who are willing to learn, um, and those especially who have support, which are going to be learning about the importance of support from a loved one, uh, technology is definitely an option. Physical wear, um, that is, can be a barrier, whether it's adhesives, um, that patients are allergic to or skin sensitivities, it might make somebody choose one type of sensor over another. Um, and then training, learning, um, all of these things are possible with just the right amount of education with the 
support team. So I wanted to make sure we talked about insulin delivery systems that aren't insulin pumps. Um, is anyone in the audience familiar with any smart pens? Okay, so a smart pen um, is basically either an insulin pen that has a um, cover to it or a specific type of device where insulin cartridges are inserted into. And these smart pens typically perform dose calculations. So they allow patients to put in their carbohydrates as they would with a uh, insulin pump. Um, it, the device would help uh, calculate a correction depending on what the patient's individualized goals are for their glucose and what their glucose is at the moment. And then the really nice thing about these smart pens is it takes into account what we call insulin on board. So I'm sure anyone in the audience who has been managing their diabetes has, has had many situations where they've been eating their breakfast, they take insulin for that, and then maybe two hours later, they're thinking, okay, now I'm gonna go out for some, for you know, a day out with my family and I'm gonna eat again, or I'm gonna have a snack, or I'm gonna do X, Y, or Z. And then the thought process becomes kind of complex. Okay, I just took insulin for breakfast and now I'm gonna do this, and how much do I take because I have insulin already and it hasn't been four hours, and how do I kind of navigate that? Is anyone kind of thinking about that situation all the time? Okay, <laughs> yeah. So that's the really nice thing about these um, smart pens. So if a pump is not the right device for the patient or it doesn't seem like a good fit, these insulin pens have these types of capabilities. And those are, uh, they're all kind of integrated with applications that go through these calculations and takes out a lot of that guesswork. So, um, the other features that are nice about these pens, they track their remaining insulin in the pen, they track the temperature of the insulin, which as we all know is very important, and they also provide reminders for misdosing. So I really like that feature, especially for um, a lot of the younger patients I see. Uh, it's nice that, that the application actually does say, rings, rings a bell, like, hey, you missed your lunchtime dose. Hey, what about your dinner time dose? And that really does make a big, big difference when it comes to the A1C reduction. If we're missing two injections a week, that still makes a massive difference in A1C and, of course, time to break. Um, some variable features, so some attach to the car uh, pen and others use the insulin cartridge cartridges, as I mentioned. And the apps vary, but a lot of them are getting more um, uh, connected with blood glucose monitors and also continuous glucose monitors. So this product um, is the InPen, which um, is now owned by Medtronic. And the pen you can see on the right side, um, and it's compatible with either Novolog, Humalog, or Fias cartridges. So you would put that cartridge into the pen. Um, and that connects to the app via Bluetooth. Um, at the same time monitoring the insulin temperature. The battery lasts for about a year, so there's no need to worry about charging it or anything like that. I really like that it can deliver half unit doses because for a lot of patients, especially you know, really young, thinner patients, or as they're getting older, I have a lot of older ladies who really need that half dose. It makes a huge difference rather than you know, uh, just uh, uh, estimating the next dose. Uh, Whole dose. It makes a huge difference if you're able to take half doses. Um, so that's a nice feature of the pen. So that create, uh, connects to the app, and as you can see, the glucose values are on the top right of that app, or I guess top left for you. And then uh, it can calculate uh, how many units you would need, uh, taking into account the insulin that you have on board. Um, it keeps a log of everything, and actually the reports are really, really nice as well. Um, they can be emailed to the doctor or to your provider or family with just a click of the button. So the in-pen has actually a really nice features on it. So the main thing about the pen is that it does have that feature 
feature of the bolus calculator, which we all know if you've been using pumps, um, that's a major feature. Um, but the bolus calculator, as I was saying, if you miss two doses per week, it can lead to an increase of an A1C up to 0.4%. So it does make a big difference. Two out of three people need help calculating their doses, and 60% of doses are stacked. So that was what we were talking about when you don't know how much insulin you have on board, it creates a lot of questions. Lack of accurate dosing data is a barrier to optimizing glycemic control. And by using the calculator, we're uh, seeing a decrease of A1C by 0.7 to 1%. So the in is a really nice option. Um, there are other options out there that are becoming more popular. Um, this one is fairly new. It's um, called Big, uh, Big Foot Unity, and it's a whole diabetes management. Um, and so basically what we're looking at are any insulin pen, um, which can be used with this device, and there are different caps that go on the insulin pen. And um, those connect to the Freestyle Libre, they also connect to a phone app. So they'll kind of show you what uh, doses are recommended and things right on that cap of the pen. Um, so that's a really nice new kind of device. Um, it's not available everywhere, but if you're interested in something like this, I would talk to your doctor because they're trying to make it more accessible to patients. So those are insulin pens, um, and there are other ones on the market, but those are pretty much the most um, popular available at, at the present time. So the next topic is pumps. Um, so why use an insulin pump? Well, there's the convenience factor in terms of less needles, um, less injections. So that makes a huge difference for patients. Um, flexible schedule. So a lot of times I meet a patient and they're on multiple doses of in, uh, insulin a day meaning that they're taking three to five or sometimes even more injections in a day. And one of the main issues that they tell me is that during lunchtime or if they're active or you know they're out and about, that's when they don't get their insulin in. So having a pump or having a device um, on, on the body does make a huge difference in terms of just access to the insulin at whatever time. Um, more precise dosing, so a lot of these um, all, all of the pumps really have the ability to do a bolus calculator and the bolus wizard, which is what I, we were talking about earlier. Um, improved control, less hypoglycemia, and then we're really going to get into what's available now in terms of the closed hybrid loop technology and how that can help patients who need a lot of variable dosing of their insulin throughout the day and how that automation has really taken off and really helped patients. So the first um, pump system we'll be talking about is called uh, the Tandem Control IQ. Um, so this is a really exciting technology. It's a closed hybrid loop technology, um, which means that the insulin is being modulated uh, based on what the continuous glucose monitor is reading. So this particular pump um, associates with the DEX so the Dexcom will give the readings and, and that will show up onto the pump. And the doctor or the endocrinologist um, helps program the basal settings with the patient or if you've been on a pump before, you might start with your previous basal settings or what you're getting at every hour. But the pump will maintain or try to maintain the glucose uh, between certain values. So when it's in the normal control IQ setting, it's going to try to maintain the glucose between 112 and 160. And when that glucose is getting above 160, that insulin is going to rise. That delivery is going to keep going. It's going to keep going. But say, for example, something happened, there's stress in the morning, you're running around with kids, I don't know, there's so many potential issues, right? You're at 180 the pump will actually deliver a correction bolus. So, so basically, um, it'll take a fraction of what you would have been giving yourself and automatically deliver that. So really trying to maintain the values between that 112 and 160, okay? Um, and those two types of features make a huge difference, having that insulin automation for the basal dose and then also those correction bolus. Uh, now, on 
the uh, opposite way, when we're looking at hypoglycemia, the basal dose or the amount of insulin that you're going to get in that time frame is going to go down if you're nearing 70, or and especially if you're less than 112, it's going to start decreasing, and then less than 70, and you're not going to get any insulin delivery. Okay? There are different modes of the control IQ, so there's something called sleep mode. So in that mode, the patient is really targeted to a very tight window between 112 and 120. So we're looking to keep the sugar really tight, but the results are pretty amazing overnight. Um, so I wanted to present this study to you guys because I, I thought it was really interesting. So this was a one-year study um, published in Diabetes Technology. And um, in the study, they had over 7,000 patients with type 1 diabetes, um, most of which had diabetes for about 20 or so more years and had been previously using the first generation of this pump. Um, and what was really interesting is um, the data was pretty remarkable. So we were looking at percent time and range. So remember what we were discussing, time and range is between 70 and 180. Um, and that's what we see on the vertical line. And the time and range was incredible, especially for overnight. So CIQ, that's control IQ, and the baseline is those who weren't using the control IQ. And you can see that uh, with the control IQ, especially overnight between midnight and 6 a.m. and uh, 6 a.m. and beyond, we're seeing time and range in the 80s, 90s percent. So the time and range is incredible. Um, and that was throughout the day, even with meals and things like that, you're still seeing that time and range in the 70 percent. Um, and then this curve over here shows very similar results for the type 2 group. So they studied a lot less patients with type 2 diabetes, but they still saw you know, the same amazing results. So looking at, um, breaking it down by age, because they had children in the study, um, but they also had adolescents, um, adults, and then elderly, which they defined as 64 and up. Um, and so looking at uh, the baseline for the school-age children, time and range was 54% increased to 65%. Adolescents, about 53, went to 65. And then here in our um, adult and older adult population, we're looking at time and range between 63% that went to 73%, so it's a 10% increase. And for elderly, a 69% at baseline to 78%. And that, if I want to draw your attention to the bottom part of these uh, graphs with the hypoglycemia. So there was no increased risk of hypoglycemia with this product. So we're looking at increased time and range without that risk of hypoglycemia. Um, so it really is pretty remarkable. And this is a one year follow up. So it's not that you put them on and you're seeing something one week later or anything like that. This has continued to be a success one year later. The thing that is really amazing and that I get to see in clinical practice is when uh, we have patients, we do see results rather quickly. So at baseline, we see that the patient had a time and range of 64%. 14 days later, they're already in the 75 percentile uh, for their time and range, and that continued throughout the study, uh, throughout the year. Um, I'll briefly just tell you about a patient that I saw in clinic, uh, just to kind of bring it home. 39-year-old um, male with a history of type 1 diabetes since he was an adolescent, um, has had Unfortunately, numerous other issues um, involved, uh, including seizure history, uh, risk for hypoglycemia. Um, and when I first met the patient, I was using just uh, multiple daily injections uh, to manage diabetes, uh, which was very difficult because he had been on a pump at one point, but due to insurance issues, uh, lost insurance, lost his pump, uh, and then was really struggling uh, with a lot of mental health issues as well to try to get back on the wagon. There was a lot of components that were going into managing. Um, when I first met the patient, actually, we were doing the Loma Libre Challenge, and we were doing it, uh, he was able to get a continuous glucose monitor, he was able to get the freestyle libre. And so that very first, one of the very first meetings after that, um, when we 
spread the uh, continuous glucose monitor together, you can see that that time number range was only about 23%. And um, the high readings were 32%, and the very high was 43%. We were missing a lot of injections. Things were just kind of all over the place. So moving forward, months later, things kind of settled out um, on control IQ and 78% time in range, with just 20% high and 3% uh, low. So really remarkable difference for somebody who made a lot of management decision making differently, but then also really the major component that helped was the technology. Um, this is just kind of through the day two, so you can see that overnight we're looking at um, the time and range target of 86%, which is really remarkable. So the tandem, um, the next thing in the pipeline for them that's really exciting is that they're going to be doing more um, uh, work into the control IQ algorithm. They're going to be also uh, working towards bolusing onto on the phone. So instead of having to pull out the pump for you know any any kind of adjustments, they'll be extremely discreet. So that's uh, something to look forward to. And then the T score is something in the works too, which is a little bit further down the line. But it's going to be a pump about half the size of the current pump. Um, it has a bolus button on the pump uh, for easy boluses. A um, little bit smaller, holding 200 units of insulin. And um, again, it's going to hopefully be controlled all through the application and have that same kind of automated uh, delivery. So that's a really exciting development to look at further down the line. Um, the next product is the Medtronic 770G. Um, and this is very similar technology, but different. So they primarily, um, this type of technology also has a continuous glucose monitor. Um, and this, uh, while the control IQ really relies on the basal rates that are set by the doctor, and both that will be going up and down, this actually kind of creates its own algorithm of what the uh, baseline rates will be. Um, so again, a very uh, successful product. And the next thing that is even more exciting is really the 780G, which uh, should be available as an upgrade for those who have the 770G. Uh, and that one will deliver automated boluses as well. So that when we were discussing earlier, when, when you hit a certain threshold, you'll get that automatic bolus. So keeping you more time to range. Um, this data was actually presented at ADA, uh, the 2020 conference, and they took um, 118 adults and 39 adolescents, and um, they, with this pump and this technology, you can actually change uh, the target. So that's a really interesting feature too, because in the control IQ technology, you kind of set on these certain targets, and this is one where you can manipulate that. Uh, they saw the A1C improve from 7.5 to 7, and that the time in range um, went from 54% to 73% overall, um, and to 79% for those who had a lower target of 100. Um, they saw some great results in the adolescents as well, um, and uh, it was a very successful study. The overnight time and range went into the 80s from 12 to 6 a.m. So the next um, pump is the Omnipod Dash. Um, the Omnipod is a tubeless insulin delivery system. So this is a great option for patients um, who don't want to be uh, connected to any tubes. I've had a few patients who were managed on a tube pump for many, many years, and when they made the switch to Omnipod, they literally told me that it was life-changing. They felt like they were liberated and didn't have any connections or anything. So for the right person, it's a really, it's a really great um, option. So um, that little pod that you see over there, um, can be inserted on the belly, uh, on the arm, um, also on, on the leg, and that connects to the Omnipod Dash or the PDF, which basically looks like a locked um, Samsung phone. It's like a little device. And on that, uh, on that device, uh, you're able to program preset meals, so we can say if you're if you're not into carb counting, if that seems too overwhelming, we can just say small, medium, or, or large meals, and we can do meal estimations. Or you can do your normal carb counting 
It'll keep into account the insulin on board and all of the other things that um, the other pumps are doing um, from, from that standpoint. The Omnipod 5 is a really exciting update, which hopefully will be coming out soon. Um, and so this is the closed hybrid version of the Omnipod. And um, it's gonna start with the connection to the Dexcom, which will hopefully then go with the freestyle Libre. Um, it can be controlled directly from the cell phone app. They're gonna start with Android and then hopefully move on and have an iPhone version as well. Um, but the PDM is gonna still be available. Um, the algorithm will make adjustments to the basal rate every five minutes um, based on what is currently happening and predicted trends from that glucose monitor. And it'll take into account the insulin on board and the sensitivity and make adjustments that way. Um, the, the Omnipod 5 will also allow for different targets throughout the day, so that's a really nice feature. So instead of saying that you want to be 120 or 140 all day, you know, you can say 100, 110. Um, oh, sorry, it starts at 110. Uh, and then there's a pr protective feature if you're exercising and want to make sure that you're not going below 150, you can set that target. The system learns um, the user's body uh, after two or three pod changes. So after about nine days, it will have its like own algorithm um, going. So that's really exciting. It's really pretty revolutionary in terms of uh, what's next. You still have to do any manual for corrections, but this will be also adjusted depending on the way that the continuous glucose monitor is trending. Uh, when they did this study, they had about uh, 100 patients, 100 children, ages 6 to 13, and then they had adults or young adults, uh, 14 to 70, they had another 128 patients. Um, and their A1C at baseline was about 7.6, 7.16. Um, and basically what they saw was, again, time and range increase from 65 to 74%. The children did really well from 52 to 68%. Hyperglycemia rates went down. Hyperglycemia went from 2 to 1.1% in the adult population. So we're seeing benefits across the board. Um, and A1C decreases, of course, too, from 7.87 and 7.2 to 6.8 in the adult population. There are other things in the, mar in the market. Um, you know, a lot of talk, especially on the West Coast, about not waiting for some algorithms and they just wanted things to move. So there's do-it-yourself kind of algorithms um, with high cool loop. That's something that is um, undergoing FDA, um, submitted to the FDA. Um, and basically the algorithm is within the app itself and can pair it with either Omnipod and possibly Medtronic in the future. And then a question that we always get is, when is there gonna be an option for an insulin with glucagon, because that would really help patients kind of keep that, that would be a you know, major breakthrough. Um, so there is something called uh, the IWIC insulin pump, and it's undergoing studies right now. Um, so that they were looking at rapid acting insulin in the pump versus rapid acting and glucagon. Um, so the pivotal trial is underway. Um, but this kind, of, this is really kind of closing that loop from the hybrid closed loop to providing the glucagon. So if someone gets low, that should kick in, and that should try to prevent even uh, any cases of hypoglycemia. Um, but with this um, islet, uh, it's going to be still a little bit of time. The pivotal trials are underway, and that looks pretty uh, interesting and promising. So now that uh, they've been working on formulations of glucagon that are okay for temperature, that was one of the main things that they were looking at to make sure that it was temperature, um, it was not so sensitive to temperature changes or things like that, but um, this is something to look for in the future. So, I know we're kind of running out of time here, but the conclusions are, uh, you know, diabetes technology, it's definitely not one size fits all. Um, there are different options in terms of continuous glucose monitors, in terms of smart pens, um, different pumps, tube, tubeless, tube, closed hybrid, uh, just basal settings, you know, there's a lot of different options. Uh, but bottom line is that across the board, we do see improvements in time and range 
We do see improvements in rates of hypoglycemia decreases. Um, and some patients really feel like it's a game changer. I mean, a simple tool, I'll say, and the next one is one of the simple tools that we have. And I have a patient um, who is a, who's a widow. And one of our first meetings, she said, you know, I, my husband used to tell me when I was hypoglycemic. She, he used to wake me up in the middle of the night and tell me. And now that I don't have him, I'm scared. I'm scared to go to sleep. So I'm going to go to sleep when my sugar is like 250. And I'd rather have that than tight control. And since she's been wearing the desk pump, she feels like she can have a good night's rest. And there was no reason that she didn't have that option earlier, right? So it's just important to know what's out there, do your research, find out a good fit, if, if it is a fit for you. Um, but there are definitely options available and it's continuing to improve. And that's a really, really exciting thing about being an endocrinologist right now. So with that, I'll take any questions, but I encourage everyone to talk to all the reps that are out there, get your questions answered, and yeah, there's a lot of resources, so thank you.